everybody, I'm Sasha Krasilovich, the Director of Research at Audio Analytics. Thank you very much for this uh, invitation to uh, speak at the uh, uh, Center for Intelligence, uh, Intelligent Sensing uh, Summer School 2019. Thanks to all of you for uh, coming, um, for attending this today. Um, so, um, I'm going to try to uh, keep this entertaining, wake you up. Uh, but also give you a perspective which comes from the industrial uh, side uh, of the question. Uh, first, a quick presentation of audio analytics. We've been uh, uh, presented by uh, Bloomberg. They found this formula like a Shazam for real world sounds, which is a simple way to explain that we do sound recognition, uh, but which is technically inaccurate. The kind of uh, 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 algorithms that we're using uh, are not the, the same uh, algorithms are, as used for fingerprinting. They're based on machine learning, so we record extensive amounts of data. We'll talk about that during, uh, during this, uh, this presentation. Uh, then we uh, train uh, a, a machine learning system to uh, recognize the sounds uh, in order to produce uh, machine listening, in order to enable uh, machines uh, to hear uh, just like uh, us humans do. Uh, so what are the, the benefits of that? Um, so essentially, if a device, if a machine is able to hear, it, it, it appears uh, more intelligent than a machine which can't hear. Uh, so this is you. Uh, this is your uh, personal devices. So you might have, uh, I mean, most of you have a mobile phone in their pocket. Uh, you uh, might have smart devices at homes. More and more uh, uh, people are buying uh, cameras for uh, home surveillance or, or uh, smart speakers. Uh, such as the uh, Amazon Echo or the Apple HomePod or uh, Google Home. Uh, you might also have headphones, and headphones nowadays have more and more computing power on board. Um, and they, they're, they're gathered under the, the uh, name of hearables, so anything that's hearing uh, actually uh, is, it falls in that class. And then more and more the cars, smart cars, so electric cars have, are packing more and more smarts in the car uh, to make the car more attractive. And so these are all the sounds which are around you uh, and the usefulness of this kind of technology. So to give you a simple example, if you're not at home and your smart speakers hear the smoke alarm, then maybe a fire is going on and it's uh, useful for uh, the protection of your home to be alerted about that. Uh, or uh, if the device hears a, a glass break, that might be an indication that somebody is trying to break into your, uh, your home or your property. Uh, and again, you might want to be alerted uh, about that. Smart cars might be able to uh, hear uh, the, the police uh, car coming, the police siren or the ambulance coming and, and, and take the appropriate uh, or, or assist the driver in taking the appropriate uh, action on that. So this is what, uh, as a company, Audio Analytics uh, is doing. Uh, so this, so uh, usefulness of something is what it does, but it's also uh, one, one of the ways to, to foster, to spread usefulness is to sell a, a product that's useful to people. Uh, um, and so uh, in terms of the, the number of uh, devices that are uh, expected to, to, to uh, be deployed by 2021, you will have 230 million smart home devices by, uh, by uh, 2021, uh, 206 million smart speakers, 82 million hearables, 92 million connected uh, cars, and 1.7 billion smartphones. Uh, so this is quite a big market. Uh, so uh, uh, in terms of both the, uh, of course, the income for a private business, but also in terms of uh, you know all the all the usefulness that we can spread uh, with so many devices uh, in the field. Um, so sound recognition is a key strategic technology that should be made available in all connected devices. That's an analyst firm that, that said that. And indeed, there is a, a huge value as a differentiator to add uh, uh, sound recognition into uh, any of these classes of, of devices to make them more intelligent. Now, uh, <laughs> of course, what we're trying to do now is to make uh, inanimate objects like uh, machines uh, uh, hear like humans do. So it's quite a challenging task. Uh, well, so let's look at what the challenges are. Uh, so let's look uh, at a smart home where, uh, as I said, we might want to do uh, anomaly detection if a strange sound is happening or detecting the baby cry. If you're downstairs while the baby is sleeping upstairs or if you're in the garden and you can't hear your baby, that thing can hear it on your behalf and alert you that baby needs assistance. Uh, smoke and sewer alarm, if you're not at home, you can detect that, get alerted, or you can have the whole house uh, ecosystem reacting to that. For example, uh, if the smoke alarm goes off, you might have your smart lock unlocking, you might have your uh, lights lighting the path to 
the uh, to the exit, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, speech detection equals presence detection and all that. So these these are all uh, set of applications in the smart home. Now all these sounds uh, are very diverse sounds. The uh, smoke alarm is a simple beep with a particular time pattern. So this. This series of three beeps is called the T3 pattern. Not all the smoke alarms have this kind of pattern, but uh, it's got uh, uh, acoustic structure in terms of spectral contents, but also a time structure. Uh, and that's important to distinguish this type of sound from, say, an alarm clock that sounds in the morning or from a truck reversing, which might be a simple beep as well. Uh, baby cry uh, is a harmonic sound, vocal sound. So it's a completely different uh, production process. Uh, it's still a series of kind of beeps, uh, kind of uh, uh, tacked together into the, uh, that, that compose the baby cry sound, uh, but it's a bit more complex. And also in the baby cry sound, you also have these zones where it's called vocal fry, where the vocal effort uh, blurs the, uh, the harmonics. Uh, this is a glass break. It's a very sudden uh, sound, uh, very high energy, almost no spectral contents in the bang. The spectral contents that comes after that is completely random. Uh, it's got some, uh, some kind of tones in it, uh, but it's, it's a very, very random sound and it's very, very different from uh, those two sounds. Uh, and I think I have one more, yes, the music. So that's harmonic, but with a different shape into the harmonics. And then uh, I have a vacuum cleaner sound. Which is a combination of shaped noise and, uh, and a, a, a kind of hiss in the middle, which is a prominent frequency. Uh, so the idea here is that all these sounds are uh, uh, coming from very different physical production process, uh, processes, and they're not uh, just one. So it, when you do speech recognition, you know that all the sounds that you're looking at are coming from the vocal tract. Uh, or when you do um, um, uh, music analysis, you know that most of the musical instruments are are coming from resonance processes. When you do sound recognition in white sense, it can be any kind of physical uh, uh, kind of production production phenomenon. So uh, sounds themselves are, 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 are a challenge, the diversity of sounds, but also uh, you could imagine in a home like this that there's going to be more soft furnishings in the bedroom, uh, the uh, bathroom is going to be more reverberant, uh, the, the living room is going to have both uh, reverberant surfaces and soft stuff, so it's going to be kind of in between. So the room effects are also uh, very challenging to, to deal with. So. I'm not, I'm not going to replay the sounds, you've heard them already, but uh, so here we have uh, 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 examples of uh, channel and room variety. So the channel is the properties of the device of the microphone that you use for recording the, your sounds or in your application. Uh, say uh, Amazon Echo might have a different microphone than a, a smart camera. Um, and I have three examples of, of room effects. Uh, so those nine are the same utterance recorded through nine different devices. Yeah, so well two years ago. 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 So here you can really hear the diversity of properties of, of channels of microphones. Uh, the last uh, ones had even noise over laid on top, the last one had some electromagnetic uh, noise on top of the sound. Uh, so this is something to, to be really careful about, like uh, every device uh, may sound uh, different. Uh, then in terms of the room effects, so dry room, a bit more reverberation. And I think that one was recorded in a, in a public uh, parking space with lots of reverberation. Uh, so again, you can hear that the environment has, uh, adds to the variability uh, of the phenomenon that we're trying to detect. Um, Right, uh, so you might say, well, yeah, but if I'm a manufacturer, say uh, Amazon uh, Echo, and I always manufacture the same device, maybe I'm dealing with less variability. Well, we actually did a study with uh, 
29, almost 30,000 microphones from one manufacturer who shall remain uh, named. Uh, and the thing is, those microphones were coming with a, a file for calibrating the microphone, so essentially the inverse of the, of the response of the microphone. And we uh, 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 compiled all these, all these microphone responses, put them on a, on a graph, and you can see you have uh, some pretty bad outliers, and you have quite a huge spread uh, in sensitivity between uh, minus 45 to 35 dB. That's 10 dB difference between uh, frequencies in, uh, across these variety of responses. So that's a huge difference between microphones, although they were coming from the same manufacturer. Hence the calibration file, but not everybody used those calibration files in their products. Uh, we were looking if there was a question of a series, like if uh, the microphones which were manufactured uh, sequentially in the same batch were similar, but actually not really. I mean, you can see that across the, the that, that's the sequence of serial numbers of these microphones. Uh, there was variation was not necessarily the, the red line is uh, is an average of the blue line is a smoothing of the blue line uh, but there wasn't really any uh, constant tendency so uh, across the manufacturing process vari variations were quite huge um, and this is the histogram of sensitivities of microphones you've heard in the previous examples that some of the channels were louder some of them were quieter so this is the spread of this kind of loud versus quiet Right, so how uh, do we go around that? So uh, first of all, for our data collection, uh, uh, because we know that it's, 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 it's an enormous uh, uh, combination, if you combine the variability of the sounds, variability of the room, variability of the microphones, it's almost an infinite space. Uh, what we did is to uh, first uh, 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 reduce the variability and then re-inject the variability with uh, computer ways. So we have designed and built a semi-anechoic sound lab with a very, very uh, short reverberation time which falls under the, the smallest time constant we have in our system. Um, and uh, that's where we do uh, a lot of our recordings. Uh, so uh, not everything can fit in there, but uh, whenever possible, so babies, dogs, and so on, uh, we record them in that room which, has, uh, uh, which is completely neutral. And we record them uh, with uh, also completely neutral uh, microphones. Uh, which are uh, like very precise uh, uh, you know, instruments to, to, uh, which are also calibrated every year and so on to make sure that their response is completely flat um, so that we can uh, record sounds and, and re uh, without the influence of the room and without the influence of the channels. Um, it's not possible for everything but it's possible for many many of the sounds that we're dealing with. Then what do we do with that? Then we do data augmentation with realistic conditions. So uh, from this training data, which is recorded in, uh, uh, with as little of the room and channel variability as possible, uh, we uh, uh, reapply convolution with real or simulated room responses and microphone responses. And then we have an augmented uh, training data set where, where we have more diversity of rooms and so on. This is me augmented, it's still me, but different um, and that's what we use for uh, machine learning um, and machine learning obviously uh, relies uh, I mean nowadays uh, it's possible to train uh, DNNs or other machines with uh, huge amounts of data uh, and so we, we blow up the amount of data and uh, that we, we then reach the full variability that's needed for a product to work and to generalize in, uh, in all these uh, environments. Uh, so as I said, it's not, um, we, we don't record everything in the uh, anechoic chamber. One of the uh, variables which, which makes the variability of sound is uh, occupancy in people's homes. People who have children are going to have certain types of sounds happening. Uh, old people are going to listen to the TV louder. Um, people who have pets, you're going to have more dog sounds or cat sounds or whatnot. We even had a, a story about uh, somebody who had a parrot which was imitating the smoke alarm. So that was one of our favorite uh, uh, false positive cases is that bird which was uh, imitating the, <laughs> the, 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 the alarms. Uh, you might have people playing music, you might be living near an airport and so on. So we also still need to do a proportion of recordings into uh, these environments to, to make sure that we capture and that we understand the variability uh, in the field. Uh, but then once we have a fine understanding of variability in the field, we can also uh, come back to uh, simulation methods to make data sets which are uh, really uh, realistic and really uh, field, field worthy. Now, uh, so, well, j yeah, to give you an idea, so now uh, we, when we started, it was almost a, a zero, zero data problem. You, you can't use sound effects libraries for training these kind of systems. There is, again, a, an anecdote on that about an uh, a, a audio, audio uh, business 
which was asked by a movie company to uh, remove the sound of the sea from a sequence they shot to be able to put a sound effect of the sound of the sea which sounds sounding more like the sea than the actual sound of the sea. So sound effects are not actually the real thing. Uh, <coughs> so you really have to have real sound. So we did break uh, hundreds, possibly thousands at this stage of, of windows, of real windows. Um, and we have bought uh, pretty much every smoke alarm available in Europe, in the UK and in the US. Uh, some of them were funny because there is a little piece of radioactive material to ionize the gas uh, and so exporting radioactive material from the US was a whole bunch of fun. Um, but anyway, so we've, we've done that kind of work and we're still actively doing it uh, as time goes. Uh, this is the, what we call the sound map, which is uh, a dimensionality reduction method uh, applied to some of the sound features. Uh, it's been done by the UMAP method, which is a, uh, similar to TISNI. Uh, but uh, so that, that is just a kind of visual impression of the uh, diversity. So each color is a different class. And then also of the fact that uh, this is a very complex manifold to fit with a, uh, a machine learning uh, algorithm. Uh, so we need to uh, have uh, something which really uh, is able to capture all that complexity. Uh, that's where uh, deep neural networks nowadays are beating every other system is that they have uh, many parameters and they are able to fit something that complex. Um, so uh, now, of course, the, the question that we get asked is what's the, what is in the box? What is your algorithm? Oh, I'm sure it's this and I'm sure it's that and so on. So obviously I can't tell you because this is the core of the intellectual property of the company. Data is very important, but also what we're doing with it is also very important. That said, I can, I can give you hints of the, of the methodology, of the me mindset behind coming up with the uh, uh, best model. Uh, so you can think of it as an optimization problem. Uh, so given a realistic data set, so having captured as much as possible of that field complexity uh, into your data set, uh, and given a meaningful metric for sound classification, and there again it's important to, to I will come back to that, but to, to have a, uh, to, the, the metric is really important, and the search space for DNN architectures, we're not just searching the parameters, we're also searching the architectures. Um, then the, the, the goal of the game is to find the best performing architecture. If you think of ImageNet, for example, the, the thing that yielded uh, the inception uh, network, which is now a kind of off-the-shelf standard for, for, for image recognition, was an extensive search across many different uh, uh, DNN uh, architectures. So uh, we're doing a similar thing for, for sound. Now, uh, it's important for the metric to be uh, meaningful and to be consistent with what, you, what you're trying to achieve. So uh, there are several questions there. So is cross-entropy on audio frames meaningful? Are we trying to do a system to classify frames, to classify those little kind of uh, 25 millisecond snippets of audio. Are we going to send an alert to people every 16 millisecond, which is the hop size of every frame? Or are we actually trying to make a classifier which is uh, uh, dealing with the whole extent of a baby cry or the whole extent of a, of a T3 pattern of a smoke alarm? Well, actually, we're, we're, we want the system to uh, alert people about events, not about frames. Uh, so it's important to reflect that into the, into the optimization metric because the system which gives the best classification rates at the frame level might not be the one that gives the best result once you've done all you need to do to gather your frames into fully packaged events. Uh, there is also a, an interesting question about true positives being discrete, uh, and even that is arguable. So uh, everybody knows what a smoke alarm or a baby cry is, uh, but I say this is arguable because the smoke alarm, is it just the beep? Is it one beep? Or is it the series of three beeps? Or is it several of these kind of series of three? Same thing for the baby cry. Do you, uh, what do you include? Do you include the, the breathing uh, in between? Uh, so baby cries having the wah, breathe, wah, and so on. Do you include the whole sequence of baby cry, or do you want to include uh, each of the uh, uh, baby cry episodes separately. So true positives are, uh, are uh, discrete, but they can be also challenging to, to, to define. And then uh, when you're doing an application where your system is detecting uh, those uh, sounds from a continuous 24-7 flux of audio, um, what is the definition of the fault positive? Uh, should you uh, chop your, uh, uh, your, your uh, flux into, uh, into fixed length uh, units? Or uh, should you have a different paradigm for what the false positives mean? Uh, so many of the systems uh, of that sort, so uh, sound uh, detection, but also uh, wake word detection, use false positives per unit of time uh, to uh, measure the false positive rate. Not just an absolute uh, false positive count, but false positive per unit of time. 
And then also it's important to keep in mind that prior probabilities matter. So uh, depending what, uh, where you are, so uh, again, if you have kids or uh, if people are at home or not, you can imagine that if people are not at home, then the home is going to be quieter, then your system is going to get less challenged than uh, if people are at home and are uh, producing all sorts of sounds which are competing with the classes uh, that you're uh, aiming to recognize. So empty home or busy home is a, is a, is a, shapes the prior probabilities of the type of sounds that you're throwing at your system. Uh, different times of the day uh, are also a, a way to shape the, the prior probabilities. Uh, but you really have to uh, be careful when you're uh, evaluating your system and also when you're looking uh, for the optimal system. Uh, uh, you have to mind what is it that the system is, uh, is exposed to. Um, so now, uh, once you have that, um, you, you search different uh, 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 types of models. Um, obviously, you can't search uh, everything, uh, but you want to have the mindset uh, which is uh, software 2.0. Uh, where uh, audio uh, where the, a guided search, you want to use some kind of uh, expert knowledge to shape the, the options that you're going to try. And auditory net is the is the trademark of our of our uh, system, which is based on neural network and other bits and bobs. And we optimize the whole system. So when I say uh, software 2.0, that's uh, inherited from um, uh, Yann Lequin and, and André Carpati. They're starting to speak differently uh, about, uh, uh, about uh, deep learning. Uh, so, um, I'm sorry, it's lots of text, but uh, what's in important is the underlying uh, ID. So, Yann Lequin is saying, uh, it's the end of deep learning. What we really, we're really doing is differential programming. So, we have blocks. So, those blocks can be DNNs, so it can be different types, can be feed forward, or can be uh, uh, convolutive, so or they can be something else than DNNs, as long as it's uh, differentiable and you can uh, calculate a gradient on it to adjust the parameters, um, uh, then you have a thing that you can, uh, you have blocks that you can connect and you can optimize your whole system uh, with, uh, with gradient descent. Uh, uh, André Carpati is saying the similar thing, but with uh, just a different name. So differential programming is the other software to zero is, is, is Carpati. Um, he says, well, we, the way we used to do programming in the past was to write each line of code and organize the structure of the program based on expert knowledge. But what's happening now is uh, uh, you define the goal of your program. So, for example, win the game of Go or satisfy uh, the pairing of uh, sound with a particular label. Uh, you write a rough skeleton of the code, so for example, neural network architecture, uh, that identifies a subset of program space to search. Uh, and then you use computational resources to search this space for a program that works. Uh, and the, the search process can be made efficient with backpropagation back and, and stochastic gradient descent. So it's a similar idea that uh, you assume some kind of structure of, the, of, the, of, your, uh, of your program or your DNN. Um, and then uh, you use backpropagation and stochastic gradient descent to, uh, to, to, to optimize uh, your model. So now, um, um, so uh, the, the, the interesting thing is subset of program space. You, you can't search exhaustively every possible architecture of the deep neural network. Uh, so you need to make a few assumptions which are, uh, uh, how to say, reasonable for your problem, for the problem that you're, that you're trying to solve. So I'm going to give you examples from the DKS challenge. Uh, again, I can't tell you what uh, audio analytics architecture is, but I can tell you what other people are doing. Uh, so in 2017, uh, was the rise of the uh, convolutive recursive neural networks where people were uh, doing um, uh, initial layers which were convolutive uh, layers and which were uh, assumed to do uh, acoustic analysis or feature extraction. Uh, then they had um, recursive uh, LSTM or GU layers to do uh, sequence modeling because these neural networks are assumed to be good at, at modeling uh, time, uh, time series or evolution of things across time. Uh, and then uh, a decision layer, which was a fully connected layer, uh, to uh, end with a final score of uh, various time slices belonging to various classes. Uh, I'm saying assume because in the end nobody knows exactly if this is actually doing the feature extraction, this is actually doing the uh, uh, time modeling and so on, because uh, it's very early days for explainability of DNNs and insight into what DNNs are doing in audio. There's lots of work on that being done 
uh, in the vision, uh, but for audio it's more difficult because it's not just about looking at uh, eyes and noses and, and wheels and stuff. Uh, uh, it's more difficult to introspect uh, the, the audio. You can look at a spectrogram, but it's not necessarily the best way to, to, to look at audio. It's not necessarily visual. You might want, for example, to resynthesize certain sounds. Uh, this is another, another example where, uh, again, you have the idea that uh, it's lots of different uh, blocks, so a convolutive block, a recursive block, a feedforward block, and then extra branches, so one softmax branch for localization of sounds into, a, into an audio recording, and then a, a sigmoid uh, branch for uh, attention uh, to certain sound. So uh, again, it's, uh, those various blocks make sense individually. Oh yeah, okay, we want a bit of attention, we want a bit of, this, this bit of that. And then you optimize that and you verify if that works, uh, uh, what works best uh, given your, your, your sen uh, sensible metric for, for your, for your uh, sound recognition task. So system evaluation uh, obviously matters. Um, open evaluations can be useful. They supply uh, reference data. They're really good for that, to, to supply data for research. Uh, they foster development and exchange of novel ideas. Usually we're all excited to go to the DK's workshop, uh, Locata, whichever, because we know that's the place where we're going to be able to have interesting uh, chats with other researchers and, and contrast things. Uh, um, and then, uh, so in the case of sound and image recognition, the, the, the uh, reference challenge is called DKs, um, uh, and it's been running since uh, 2013. And um, yeah, um, so now they also have a bit of a of downside, which is they can bias the problem significantly. Um, one of the questions is: the database realistic or whatever was affordable, whatever people could get access to, given the funding for data recording or given the time they had. Um, so it's not necessarily uh, field data, but it's still it's, it, it's a good starting point in, mo in most cases, but you have to be critical of that. Uh, then solving the problem or winning the competitive evaluation. So uh, one of the questions is the people who participate to, to, to these um, competitions, uh, uh, there has been a bias. For example, I used to work in speaker recognition, and at some point people were throwing everything they could to be the first in the ranking, uh, and were coming up with systems that would never actually be useful in real life uh, because they were uh, they kind of overfit the problem uh, in, in some way. Uh, so there is also that thing about how do you actually regulate your uh, your uh, data challenge so that people um, don't overfit to the challenge. Actually, uh, uh, look also at uh, you know innovative solutions, uh, elegant stuff, and so on. Um, and also the comparative evaluation metrics uh, are uh, good to rank the systems, uh, but there is a question whether they really reflect user experience. Um, for example, the, uh, the, the system which makes the uh, say smallest amount of false, uh, well, or uh, yeah, the, the, the type of errors that the system uh, is making, are they uh, qualitative, uh, qualitatively relevant? If the system makes lots of false alarms but on things that people don't care about, then uh, that's not a good uh, uh, representation of, of user experience. So um, uh, yes, ranking is different from an actual opinion score uh, that would be uh, calculated for each of the systems. So they have their pros and cons. Overall, we, 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 we're very happy that these things are happening. But but you just have to be careful that uh, also uh, that, that there is alignment between the challenges and things that uh, are uh, uh, useful in terms of, say, selling them or something like that. I'm not saying we should pull the, uh, the uh, academia to uh, industry, but we have to be uh, concrete about whether we are in the same field or not. Uh, evaluation in real conditions is hard and costly, but necessary for industrial success. Uh, so, would the systems uh, that you're working on be able to operate on a consumer chip? Um, so, um, in the last DKS challenge, there were lots of systems which were ensemble methods with very, very large neural networks. Those things would never uh, uh, function in a hearable. Uh, but also, it's not guaranteed that all that firepower was necessary to achieve uh, this uh, level of performance. Uh, you could sometimes distill an ensemble of, of uh, models into a smaller one that would be able to run uh, into, uh, into a smaller, small chip. 
Uh, and one of the interesting questions is uh, what, what would be the performance trade-offs that you do? Uh, so it's not just about uh, um, uh, uh, evaluating the performance, the sound recognition performance, but the sound recognition performance comes at a cost. And in the last DK's challenge, it was really nice that uh, now we had a two-dimensional evaluation, which was uh, the performance of the system according to a one-digit metric, say accuracy or something, but versus the number of parameters that was involved in the system. And it was interesting to see now clouds of points of what trade-offs you have, uh, what quality trade-offs you have for the cost of computation that they imply. Uh, also, required audio and computation hardware. If you have a data set that has been recorded with only one type of recording device in only one type of environment, then you might be missing on the uh, on the fact that uh, uh, consumer devices, or uh, yeah, if you really want something to be useful and to be spread to many devices, the uh, uh, microphones are not going to be perfect, and the computation hardware might not be a supercomputer. Uh, and then, uh, yes, in terms of, again, the variability effects, uh, were significant variability effects neglected into the, the evaluation? That's a very important question because you might have some uh, bias that, that you uh, oversaw in your, in your evaluation. So it's really important to make sure that uh, everything is covered. Now there's a very, very interesting thing which is, uh, is your system really doing what you think it is doing? And the story about that, that comes from uh, the work of a researcher called Bob Sturm, uh, who worked on this kind of thing for, for a while. Um, the anecdote is Clever Hans was a horse who could do mathematics. So um, I think in the 30s or something. Um, um, uh, there was this horse and people were asking, okay, uh, how much is two plus two? And the, the horse was like tapping four times the hoof on a piece of wood. And people were like, oh my God, this horse is so clever, can do mathematics. And one uh, professor, Oscar Funk, the guy with the, with the, with the lab coat here, uh, really tried to understand what the horse was really doing and doing various experiments. And it turned out that the horse was picking on the reactions of, of its owner. And the owner himself was not uh, aware that the horse was doing that. Uh, as in when the uh, horse was getting close to the solution, the owner would, uh, or the audience would start to have that kind of moment of suspense. And the horse was actually detecting that. And one of Bob Sturm's experiments was to take uh, the results of a, a jo music genre classification task, uh, which was um, um, uh, done on a data set called uh, GTZAN, I'm not sure how, GTZAN. And he perturbated the music uh, in uh, ways of uh, uh, slowing it down or accelerating and modifying the tempo of the music and showed that many of the systems which were top ranking systems in genre recognition were completely, their performance was completely breaking when the music was, say, still jazz but slower or still vaults but faster. So thus proving that the systems were doing uh, tempo recognition, tempo classification rather than genre recognition. Uh, so it's really, really important to uh, to make sure that uh, that uh, your your system is not uh, fitting some kind of bias of the data, uh, rather than and, and that it's really doing the, all the generality of what you expect it uh, to do. Uh, and Bob Sturm used to say that the the system is a horse until proven otherwise. So it belongs to you as a researcher, as a developer of such a system, to uh, perturbate and do all the kind of sensitivity analysis to make sure that uh, the system is is really uh, doing uh, what you think it's doing. Uh, privacy questions are, are really important. They are a question of um, uh, you know ethics and also uh, people. Uh, there is lots of, uh, of uh, questions from the public about about privacy, which is uh, very fair. Uh, so we have an American actor having a private moment with dogs. I'm not exactly sure why, but there we go. Um, uh, if you want to understand the privacy laws, a uh, very uh, simple thing to do is to understand that they uh, be, can be traced back to World War II, where people with a certain uh, political opinion or sexual orientation or uh, religious belief were exterminated. Uh, so private, privacy laws rely on definitions of sensitive information, uh, and there is a legal definition, so uh, again, like political opinion, uh, um, uh, sexual orientation and so on, are uh, defined as sensitive uh, uh, information, and not everything is sensitive. And also identifiable information. One very important element is to understand that uh, uh, sensitive information falls under privacy law if you are able to uh, relate it to somebody's identity. If you can say uh, the person who lives at uh, Abbott's Close in Cambridge is, uh, I don't know, uh, 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 wearing a blue jacket, then, then, uh, this, then you must be very careful about what you do with this data. Uh, in the case of sound recognition, uh, most sounds we do are 
are, uh, so first of all, when we do the data collection, we make sure that the data is not identifiable. If there is any, anything identifiable as data, we just remove it. Um, uh, and most of it <coughs> is not sensitive, as in your smoke alarm doesn't tell your sexual orientation, hopefully. Um, consent uh, matters, so uh, there is lots of things that you can do with uh, any data, including the sensitive and identifiable data, if you have the consent of, your, uh, of, the, of the people who uh, are the suppliers of this data. Uh, and actually, uh, we had lots of volunteers who let us uh, record in their home uh, against, say, uh, John Lewis voucher or Amazon voucher, um, and, and gave us the consent to use their data. With all the uh, facilities in place for them to control their data, uh, they have a right to ask us to remove uh, the data and so on, so all the GDPR obligations uh, being met uh, properly. Uh, but you, you can get consent from people to use uh, data for building that kind of system. Uh, public perception matters and it impacts commercial success. You have to uh, really uh, be, uh, create the trust with your customers that you're managing their data in a way that's really privacy aware. Um, and general public in, uh, has a limited faith in how data is being protected and processed in the cloud because people don't see, um, don't necessarily understand uh, encryption or don't necessarily see uh, that you have a special access restriction to your server room or something. Uh, that's the kind of secret thing that those companies are doing in the background, so the trust in that is, is very limited. Uh, and also, uh, there was a study, um, um, I can't remember, the, I can send you the references if you, if you send me an email about that, uh, where people uh, uh, studied those things for around all the smart speakers. And there's also limited faith in terms and conditions. People, uh, most people believe that uh, big companies can change their T's and C's behind their back. It's not actually true, but that's, uh, that's the, the extent to uh, probably half of the population uh, is believing that uh, their data is not being managed properly. So, uh, in general, people would like the AI devices to be more like humans. Uh, and for all the knowledge uh, being locked, uh, for us, all the knowledge is, is into the head. Uh, as of today, uh, nobody can, re can read your mind, so you can uh, hold your data in a way that's well protected. And uh, for uh, smart devices, the, the one of the requirements is, they, is, is for them to be a bit more like humans. Uh, so running on board the device uh, matters and is a significant asset. So our, our system runs uh, on board the device. There is no uh, link required to the cloud, apart from sending the alerts once the detection is being, uh, is being uh, operated. Um, and uh, it's important to avoid uh, that data leaves the, the device. Uh, so new technical solutions are emerging in that direction. There is a technique called federated learning where uh, the uh, training is being distributed to uh, the devices themselves in a way that's really uh, encrypted and so the devices are just uh, sending back and forth the statistics which results from the bits and pieces of the training uh, and that's one of the things which is, uh, which is really ramping up at the moment to go around uh, the, the public concern about what is it that big companies are doing uh, in the cloud. Right, so uh, I think I'm on time, yeah. Uh, so takeaways from, from uh, this talk uh, is uh, data is a parameter. It must capture the full real world variability if, uh, if you are in the industry and you want to make a product that's going to really work in the field. Um, a part of the industrial expertise is, is about judging the coverage relevance and variability of your data in order to build high performance uh, data sets and data really uh, is a parameter, it's not just about the type of DNA, uh, uh, data uh, is really important to have the right data for, for, for uh, what you want to do. Uh, DNNs uh, are a given for good reasons. Uh, they are flexible, uh, nowadays we can train them properly, they are very flexible, they can uh, fit some very complex uh, manifolds. Um, but there is that question, what is the best model? And, and the approach to find the best model, it's, it, just think of it as an optimization problem. Software 2.0, uh, you assume blocks that you want to put together and you do that expert guided search into the, the model space given realistic data. Uh, meaningful metrics are crucial. Uh, comparative metrics may not be relevant to user experience. Uh, system is a horse until proven otherwise. You really want to make sure that, that, that you're training the right thing for your problem and you really want to make sure that what's going to get out of your uh, lab or your development team uh, once it's in people's homes is not going to do something completely unexpected. 
and AI is expected to remain as private uh, as the brain. This is also a very, very important uh, takeaway. Thank you very much. <laughs> By the way, we are hiring, so if uh, any of you are finishing their PhD or postdoc contracts or something, please talk to us. Yes? Uh, hi. 